as we see, the title of today is called Obstacle to Salvation, which is pride, right? Pride. I think every one of us know about pride. And um, we even, uh, if, we, if we look at the Bible, there are numerous, numerous verses about pride. How God hates pride. How God, uh, how God will resist the prideful, but will, you know, but will assist, will give grace to the humble, right? To the lowly. Um, but yet, there are so many. Uh, in fact, uh, until yesterday, I, I, I don't have any idea what to preach. Uh, so it was not until uh, in the afternoon, then, uh, then this thing come. So, uh, but there are so many things to speak of. I have to, I cannot do everything. I cannot say everything it has Bible to have to say about pride, but I will go according to what was given to me, right? Uh, okay, the, what we say is that there is only one way. We all know there's only one way to salvation. One way, there is through Christ. But more accurately, we will say that repentance towards God and faith towards Jesus Christ, what he has done on the cross, right? Uh, that was mentioned in Acts 20, 21. No, but there are also several ways that will prevent one from getting saved, right? And today, we only talk about one of them we call pride, right? Okay, first, we talk about the origin of humility first. In order to talk about pride, we have to talk about humility, okay? Uh, love, mercy, and compassion, and comfort, and even humility originated from God. Nothing in this world just appeared like that, right? No, but God did not in the Bible explicitly, explicitly say that he, I'm humble. He didn't say that. But his ways that was recorded in the book of God demonstrated his character to be humble, right? As in, I will just quote a few examples, right? Number one, he listens to the lowly, right? And in Exodus chapter 32, when the people of God rebelled against God and not listening to him and in disobedience, now, and God regretted that, right? Uh, he wanted to wipe them out and make Moses' descendant uh, somebody, right? To raise him up. But you see, and Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptian speak and say, For the mischief did he bring, for mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? <coughs> Moses not having the chance of becoming somebody great, but um, actually gave God, um, what you would call that, uh, an advice, or so to speak. Say, why would you let yourself be spoken badly by the non-believers, saying that they will slander you, that you will bring all the Israelites out from Egypt in order to slay them, to consume them? You see, Therefore, turn from thy wrath, thy fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against thy people. And next, he said, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servant, to whom thou swearest by thy own self, and saith unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I was spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And verse 14 says, and the Lord repented of the evil that he taught to do unto his people. Very different from what we now see that if you dare to correct any, especially the high and mighty, right, who are prideful, you stand to be in trouble. You stand to be, you stand to face the wrath yourself, right? Such is the current situation of many, many uh, countries and institutions and societies. But the Lord, who is the creator of the universe, listen and say, that's fine. I will not, I will do as you say. And we can see that he also came as Jesus in human form, you know, even though he was a creator of human, of men. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, and without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. <laughs> Justified in the spirit. Sin of the angels. 
preach unto the Gentiles, believe on in the world, receive up in glory, referring to Jesus Christ himself. So he came as a human being. Of all the things, he could have come in somebody high and mighty, and, and, and it will not be, it is, even as we see, watch in the movie, right? If you see all these pompous kings and mighty kings and even so-called the gods. But he came as a lowly human. What would you think when people recognize you, you know, as, your, as your creation and not giving honor to you as a creator? Is, uh, I don't know how to say it, but maybe you can look at this. Oh, I would say you are a bow, a bow. But the bow was made by you, but I say you are a bow. How would you feel? But God is able to keep that. And the creator of the universe came in the form of the tiny creation of his, just a human being, right? Just now we read, it's a little lower than angel. He will not be, he will not be even accepted by his own people, which is his own creation, but he did not mind that. He did not mind that. In John chapter 1, verse 10 to 11, it says, he was in the world, referring to Christ, who is God, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. I think the closest feeling one would get is a, par- a, a, pa- a, a father or a mother have children who would not recognize them, who would not accept them. That would be humanly closest feeling that I can describe. Now, he also came not as a king, but as someone lowly. In Corinthians chapter 8, uh, first Corinthian, right? I think I, second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, your and my sake, he became poor, that he through his poverty might be rich. We all know what it is. He become poor, he he become the lowly, he come to minister so that we know the gospel, that we may be rich in Christ. And he was also not lowly outwardly. You see, there are many people who will be lowly outwardly. They can be humble outwardly. But he was also lowly and humble inwardly. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, it says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Jesus Christ said that, say, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye may and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Essentially, he just said to all those who want to know of him, say, learn, learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart, not in surface. No, he came also to serve and to die for those who still who were at that point of time still rejecting him, hated him. In Mark 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be minister unto, but to minister. Well, either either he is a hypocrite, right? Like we see many nowadays, they say, Oh, I'm I come to serve, but he's serving himself, right? But either he is a hypocrite or he is telling the truth. He said, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, Jesus spoke these words after the disciples were displeased because James and John were, were, were trying to be, say, hey, Lord, will we be able to sit on your left-hand side and the right-hand side in heaven? And the rest of the disciples were not happy. Why? Because they're not happy because everyone wants to be special want to be, have a special place in the kingdom of heaven and where Christ said, well, you have to be a servant because the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto but to minister. That is the heart of God and the humility that is defined by God himself. And it's, in short, it is inward humility. It will show outwardly. 
It is not demanding to be rightly accepted, but there is always comfort in being right with God, whether you are accepted by the world or not. It does not demand justice to be served when you are being wronged, but there is comfort in being right with God. It does not seek to be treated like what one thing he should be treated. Many people are not happy because he thinks that this is how I should be treated, but he didn't get that kind of treatment. He is not happy. But the humility of God is that it does not seek to be treated like what he thinks he should be treated. It is okay to be rejected. The comfort is being accepted by God. And it does not, uh, it does the opposite, exact opposite of what the world expects. Because God cares about man and man's soul. When someone did something evil, what the other party who did evil to you might be weary of you when you come smiling at him. When he's hungry, when you will feed him, you'll give him food or else he die or else his family suffer. Maybe he might think, hmm, is there poison in it? That's projection. But it, but the humility of God does the opposite what, of what the world expects. So many will say that only God can do that. True. It's true. Only God can do that. But the word of God also says that Christians can do that in Christ. Now, the next we talk about the origin of pride. Okay, after we know <coughs> what is the definition of humility, we talk about the origin of pride. Now, God, okay, many of you might wonder why, why did we read 2 Kings chapter 5? Okay, it will come later. Now, God is the right and accurate embodiment of humility. Anything that is deviated, I'm not even talking about exact opposite, is not godly humility. Now first, we talk about the origin. That is exact opposite of God's. Okay, In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13 to 17, we talk about this creature. His name, its name is Lucifer. And in the word of God says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the bryo, the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, and the admiral, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tablets, and thy pipes, these are music instrument, was prepared in thee, in the day that thou was created. He said, verse 14, and say, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So Lucifer, you see, Lucifer was a created angel of God. He was a chief angel and was very special. Adorned in ten types, I counted ten types of precious stones and matter. And Lucifer was also a musical angel. You can call it a living body with musical instruments. Right? My mind imagined that an angel, but the body is fused with musical instrument. And he makes music just by his thoughts. This is my imagination, of course. Now, Lucifer was specially anointed by God. And the Bible says that Lucifer was perfect when he was created in verse 14. But Lucifer's sin started when he was more interested in dealing with the things of the world. We look at verse 15. See, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. God said that until iniquity was found in thee. See, he started to sin. And why? 
We look at verse 16. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Okay, before that, I will go through this. See, now, he started to be more interested in dealing with the things of the world. Now, the verses prior to these verses about Lucifer's sin was referring to the king of Tyre, which is a merchandising and rich island nation at the time. Now, note that the interest in the things of the world led to much violence. I don't know about you. Maybe even the avocado we eat right now, there's a war going on in Mexico because of avocado, because of the price of avocado is rising. So there is much violence. Now, once a perfect angel, he would have known, he would have known that God's desire is for <coughs> love, justice, and righteousness. He should have known. But he focusing, he fo it focused on the things of the world instead. And there is his agenda, its agenda. I will talk about this later. He did, he did not care about what God cherished the most. Therefore, you have injustice, you have violence, death, and betrayers are nothing as long as it can fulfill its own vision of this world. All this focus on worldly matter was not even the foundation of Lucifer's sin. The foundation of his sin can be found in verse 17 as we look at it now. Before that, um, okay, we go to 17. He said, Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Right? Lucifer's heart was lifted up because of his beauty. It is strange. I can be so proud of myself because I look so handsome and I did not do anything to make myself look handsome. But I know I'm not handsome. Okay? That's a joke. But anyway, nowadays people use phone, right? The Beautify app to make themselves look beautiful. But it is a, it is a strange thing that, you know, he, he was proud of his own look which he has Nothing to do with it. And Lucifer's wisdom, which was obviously when he was perfect, was the same as the wisdom of God. But it was corrupted because he became prideful along the way. Because he became prideful of his own beauty. The result was his downfall. And we see in verse 16 and verse 17, he said that God said, I will cast thee out as profane out of the mountain of God. Note that God looked at all this, the pride that welled up in his heart. He said, in, my, in his heart, he is very beautiful and God viewed this as profane. And I will destroy thee and I will cast thee to the ground. That's what God said. Now, I would like to take a, a special mention about the nature of Lucifer. Now, Lucifer, as we know, is Satan, and he is the king of the world right now, right? And Lucifer was a beautiful creature adorned with precious stones and metals, right? Now, in its corrupted state, what will it teach to the world? What do you think? My take is that being, it will teach the world being adorned with gold, gold and precious stones is a symbol, or is a symbol of spirituality. It's a symbol of success that you are right with God. Lucifer was also a great musical being. What will it do with music? Corrupt it and make it a channel to bring one from godliness to worldliness and ultimately godlessness. Lucifer was an angel without gender. Right? Angels are without gender. 
And the Bible says it was the he, it was the father of all the lost. Corrupted gender appropriation, and confusion, confusing the lost. Hence, you have you hear they are. Yesterday, I checked on the internet how many genders are there on purpose. It states you have male and female and the transgender and the gender neutral and the non-binary and the agenda and the pan gender and the gender queer and two spirited gender and it's growing by the day. He or she, who has ears, let he or she hear. These are the works of Lucifer. Now the foundation, back to the foundation of Lucifer's doctrine, it was not, it was not, he was, he did not love the world. He didn't, he didn't really love the world, but he's interested in dealing with the things of the world. But his foundation was pride. And these passages was brought out last week by Brother Roy. I'll put it up here again in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 15. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which this weakened the nations? Now, from 13 onwards, we will pay attention, right? For thou hast said in thy heart. Now, the verses where God, these, these are the verses that God gave the assessment of Lucifer, of what is in his heart. Now, you see that God say that, for thou sayest, say in thy heart. Nobody know what we say, in what we think in our heart, but God can see that. And he say that the pride is in the heart. It may not even be verbalized so that you know that is his intention. The real prideful will not verbalize their pride. It's only the foolish. Now, but God sees the heart and know that he is prideful, it is prideful, and, it, and the progression of pride in Lucifer. And we read, he say, I will, the first I will ascend into heaven. Lucifer wanted to be among the heavenly beings. He thought he, he thought it deserved a place there. And second, I will, he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, the stars of God um, normally refer to angels of God. So in the second way, Lucifer wanted to be the highest among all the heavenly beings by promoting himself. As he said, I will exalt my throne when he is just one of the angels, even though he was considered special. But the sad truth also, Lucifer was already an angel in, with, the heavenly body, uh, with the heavenly angels together. You, he may not be the highest, or he may be the highest, but his own idea of being the highest differ from God. God set him, set it there, to do his work, but he thinks he deserves much, much better. And the third, he said, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sight of the north. <coughs> Lucifer wanted to establish himself. He said, I will sit. As in confirming himself as the chief of all the heavenly beings. And then the next progression, he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Lucifer wanted to reach where no other heavenly beings has been. And finally, the I will be like the most high. He wanted to replace God. Yet, and Christ uh, and God said, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now, God did not obviously create pride, but it came from the hearts of Lucifer. Now, we look at the pride of the lost. Now, there's nothing new under the sun as the wisest teacher, King Solomon, said in Ecclesiastes 1, 9, he said, there is the thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. No new thing. 
the spirit of Lucifer lives on. So are the lost, regardless they are lost believers or lost, uh, lost unbelievers or lost professing Christians. They do the will of their father, Lucifer. John chapter 8, verse 44. He said, Ye, Jesus Christ, say this, Ye are of your father, the devil, the last of your father, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and about not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus spoke to the Jews who have the assurance that they will surely go to the heaven, the kingdom of heaven, because they are the children of Abraham. But Jesus told them that they are not safe, that they will only do the last of their father. Now, this applied to the lost as well. Now, thus, there are two kinds of people in this world, the lost and the safe. The lost comes in two forms, the unbelieving and those who appear to believe. How did the lost show their pride against God? Now wait, someone might ask, how can the unbelieving who do not believe in God, do not believe that he had existed, would have any grudges against God? He didn't even know his being existed. In Romans chapter 1 verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, the things God revealed to the lost were not his mercy, not passion, compassion, not love yet. That was for later. God showed his wrath against all men because of their unrighteousness and ungodliness. Many will even say, I have not sinned. I obeyed my parents, I cared for my family, I did my very best as an employee, and so on, and so on, and so on. Hmm. Holding to a truth that being caring, being loving, being hardworking is the right thing to do. That is truth. But God requires you to perform to the 100%. That is, never once you fail in doing the right thing. Because if you depend on doing the right thing in order to feel right with, in your unbelieving state, maybe a deity, an unseen God, an unidentifying uh, higher power, in the word of God say it is a curse. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law and to do them. Simply put, the book of the law, all that was commanded by God, will be a blessing if you are able to continue thereon. But it will become a curse because you depended on this doctrine of doing works, doing good deeds. Now, therefore, the darkened hearts reckon that they themselves are okay. The truth of God's word will show that they are holding on the truth, which is like hardworking, uh, hard work, love, and compassion, but in unrighteousness. Why? Because they think that what they did is enough for God to accept. But God will not accept that. Some will also say that does not explain why an unbeliever even feels anything about what God said in his word. Because to the unbeliever, this God never existed. In Romans chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, it says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. What can be known of God is already in every one of us before we are even saved. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. How do you see the invisible things of him? You can't see him. He's a spirit. But you are able to see him from the creation. 
And then the other thing is that being understood by the things that are made. Not only does anyone in this world who have said they have not touched the Bible before, never heard a single sermon before, can say that they do not know there is a God because it was already understood, made to be understood to them. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. One cannot say I've never hear about God. And therefore, I should be exempted from the judgment. What is right in God's eyes is buried in the hearts of all men, in the form of conscience. One man can see and understand that there is a God, there is a creator, so that they are without excuse. They can give tons and tons of excuses towards pastor, towards a friend, towards the parents, but they can never do that before the Almighty God because God will not buy it. Otherwise, how do you explain someone getting offended by the Bible, a book that he do not read or believe in? How do you explain someone offended by the word spoken of God, by God, whom the believer thinks it is, he is not existing? How do you explain someone is offended by being told that he is in sin according to the word of God? Which he think this God is a made up God? How do you explain someone is being offended by being told that he is heading toward hell when he thinks that this is a made up religion and hell is not real? The laws, however, they are mesmerized by three things in various degrees some more, some less. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 16, say, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of this world. What desires come from Lucifer? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But today we talk about pride. Or, as I have said, Lucifer took interest in the things of this world not because it loved the things of this world. It owns the world right now until Christ returns. His job is to keep lost people lost until they die and end up in hell. Then his job is done for that person. Thus, it, has, it, it will have so much ideas, so many teachings and philosophies to get the lost to embrace the world in all aspects of the life in this world. From material gain to culinary tasting, games, alcohol, drugs, sex, intellectual pursuits, and seeking of higher wisdom. All this serve to distract the lost from thinking about why they are here, where they will go, and what are their purpose in this only one life. Apart from the lust of the eyes and flesh, pride is the topic of today. Now, how prideful are the lost in the eyes of God? I repeat that, that again. How prideful are the lost in the eyes of God? Because as human, we often don't see we not, not often, we will not see as clearly as God do. God does. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 to 22, we say, Because that, when they knew God, they glorify Him not as God. Before that, deep in their heart, they know that there's a higher being. They know that there's a God. There's no, there's no, there's, the Bible says there's no doubt about that, but yet, they knew they do not glorify him as God, neither were they thankful. They were not thankful for what? For their own existence. They are not thankful for the air they breathe. They take it for granted. And in fact, I, think, I believe even Christians sometimes take it for granted too. The food they enjoyed, the time they have with their loved ones that God has blessed. Instead, they keep thinking about the bad time they experience and lamenting on the suffering of others in the comfort of their back supporting chair in the aircon room, typing away in their lamentation. 
They became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. The Word of God tells us that their hearts were darkened by their own choice of focus. They focus on their own wisdom and not on God's. The Word of God tells us that they think, what they think of themselves. They think themselves as wise people. But in God's eyes, they are fools. Now, I don't mean that they are, they are fools in the sense that they are stupid that you can clearly see that they are not wise. They are making very foolish decisions in life. No, not that. Sometimes we can't see that because see, they can be academically outstanding people. They can be reputable entrepreneurs. They can be distinguished politicians and even religious leaders. <clears throat> An academic, uh, academically uh, outstanding person may look humble when he's next to a plumber. <coughs> Have you seen, especially myself, oh, wow, I, I'm an engineer. I built HTB in the past. I built golf course, right? Uh, even tunnels. But I stand like a student next to a plumber when he's doing his work. What? I, how you do that, huh? Right? Because I don't know what he knows. But until you touch on his worldview and tell them it is flawed in the eyes of God, be prepared for the avalanche of refutation, no, even in papers. The distinguished politician may be humble until you point out his policies are unjust in the eyes of God. In short, lost men, whether in, clothing, in the clothing of unbelievers or professing Christians, hold to their own versions of truth. Their pride was hurt when confronted with the word of God. One good example today is Naaman. Naaman was a great Syrian general with many, many battle victories, but he was unfortunately leprous. He has no cure. He was told that a prophet in Israel could heal him. He decided to pay the visit to this prophet, who is Elijah. Now, take note, at that time, Israel was, at the time, a weak country under the mercy of the Syrian king. Naaman could easily summon Elijah to him. He was humbled by his leprosy. He decided to go but he was obviously not humbled by the God of Elijah. Many people will decide to come to church to seek God because he is not well. He will come to church because he has family issue. He will come to church because he has financial issues. Seeking for miracle help. So we see Naaman was an outwardly humble general when he came to see Elisha. The words of Elisha was so simple to understand. And we see in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 10 to 11, and Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. What he is imagining is, knock, knock, knock. Elijah opened the door. Oh, general, general. Oh, you have this problem. Okay, no worry. By the name of the Lord. Boom. Then thunder strike, rain falls, and then he become better. Maybe that's his imagination. Naaman was offended because he had his thought on how he could be healed. In the eyes of the world, Naaman would look very humble. A highly decorated general went, came all the way from Syria, capital, to 
a lowly village, to a lowly house, knocking at the door, and there come not the prophet, but his servant. It would be likened, like, oh wow, a president came to eat at a humble local kopitiam. It's something, something you will find in straits times. Because he came as a lowly person. But not in the eyes of God, Naaman's reaction exposed his pride. And that is in himself, the pride is in himself. It was not said in the Bible, but Naaman's reaction, re- reaction seemed to suggest that he thought that the person of his status demands special treatment, even special treatment from God. His healing had to be spectacular, like he thought it should be. Without God, the truth is, all a lost person can think is self. Offerings on an altar out of fear of what will happen if I do not offer. One prays to deities for 4D, for healing, for prosperity. The do-gooders post pictures of the deeds on Facebook. Even believing in God can be self-centered too. The seekers of Jesus came to him to be fed, remember? John 6, 26. The Pharisees prayed loudly and visibly to show their religious piety so that they can be respected. The religious fasted with a sad face. I fast because of my God. So is the pride of the lost is being offended the same way. They know the things they are doing cannot satisfy their soul's need. They will decide that there is no God because all God did was to show them how bad they are, how miserable sinners they are. They will heap unto themselves the writings of philosophers, evolutionists, to reinforce what they already chose to believe, that there is no God, we are just animal, there is no moral code to follow. Nevertheless, the outward show of piety to these things of men actually borderline worship by placing man's word above the truth of God's word. The word of God testifies in Romans chapter 1, verse 23 to 24 that the prideful that changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like two corruptible men and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature. Creature doesn't mean, it's more than the creature. Creature. We are creature. More than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Some will worship images of God's creation because it somehow makes sense to them. Images can be mammals, reptiles, insects, or even human beings. Some will worship Mother Earth instead of God. Mother Earth is a creature. Some will worship men who gave the laws the idea of why they were here and that why, why, what they are indulging in is not sin, it's the fault of others. They love the idea, don't they? The idea of evolution do away with God and his moral laws. Men are mere animal, and all they do is to be the top of the food chain and to procreate. I ever heard the man who is a serial womanizer, he he once told me, well, according to evolution, I'm just an animal. All I do is procreate. All these philosophies led to extreme racism, 
eugenics, sexual liberla liberation, and may I say more about this. When one does not honour God, and with their own lust, believe in teachings that will support that lust, it will be, it will be a natural cause that the lust in that person will triumph. How so? Cumulating to dishonouring their bodies, how it is being done. I would reckon that whatever is modified or done with the bodies are ungodly as measured by the will of God, such as maybe cutting on one skin, gender change, and even altering the facial features. I'm not even talking about beauty uh, uh, for beauty, but the things were done on the face or the body to prove a point that he, is, he or she is not of God. And finally, there is fornication. It is the least mentioned word nowadays, as, and it is the most common thing in the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, he said, flee fornication. The word of God says, flee, run. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. That means it's outside of your body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. So whether it is cutting of skin, sex change, or facial, it always takes more than two persons to do so. It is honoring themselves between each other. The word of God is clear. Such a person changed the truth of God into a lie. There is to lay out something that sounds like truth, but what is done and is taught is contrary to what, uh, to, contrary to God's nature. Example, God is love, which is true. You should love all men despite of his hideous acts. The judge should let him go. The person he killed, he already died. Why should you terminate his life? Again, you are a human, and the most important thing in your life is your happiness. Such a person who also worship and serve the Creator more than the Creator is manifested by what? Treating man's word above God's word. Treating oneself's feeling, emotion, and comfort as a gauge of happiness, as a gauge of being right. I feel angry, therefore I must be right. Thus, serving the creature that is called self. He was, back to Naaman, he was prideful. Prideful in the, fact, uh, in the sense of the, he un, with his understanding of the world. In 2 Kings verse 5, verse, uh, verse 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 12, in his wrath, he muttered such words, Are not Abana, Fapa, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Naaman compared the rivers of his country to Jordan River which were, to him, far better and even probably far cleaner. He thought such a simple healing formula was stupid. What? I just go there, dip myself. I came all the way here just to dip myself. And you, Elisha, didn't even come and talk to me. You asked your servant to talk to me. And I dip myself there and I will be healed? Are you taking me for a fool? It will, he thinks that it will make him look like a fool if he believe it. Would it not describe the loss according to the scripture? Now, I do not aim, I do not aim to ridicule the loss, which is far from it. The word of God shows us the hearts of these lost people when confronted with the simplicity of God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto them. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The scripture goes as far as saying the lost cannot understand because it requires a person with the Holy Spirit to discern, meaning the person must be saved. 
the laws were raging because the word of God clashed with their conventional wisdom. It cannot be so simple. Do you think I am stupid or what? But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, say this, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. This reaction was foretold in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, referring to Jesus Christ, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. This behavior is not new. The raging is not new under the sun. The offended need to hear this. Christ, the very person who is also God, came and told us the way of salvation, which is a gift, and that is simple. The saved who believe in him shall not be confounded. It simply means this. The saved have the answer to everything in this life. Where will I go? What will I be? Hey, Sarah, Sarah, no, but hey, God. Is making myself happy the only way in this life? How do I deal with my hurt? How do I deal with those who hurt me? Am I the center of the universe? Is having more things the way forward? Is being busy the way of life? I would be lying to you if I say I have all the answer in life already because I hold on to the Bible. That is far from it. Because I have, to my shame, not sought the Bible on every issue I have in life diligently as I would like to. But unmistakably, to every issue brought before the Lord, there are solutions and it often starts with the Lord showing where I was wrong to begin with. It doesn't feel good. It will take humility to admit that I'm wrong and start obeying God's prescribed solution. That is why it is precious to the saved. In, continue in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. He says, Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builder disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. To the unbelieving, the word of God said, you are disobedient. The word of God said plainly, your disobedient and unbelief did not change anything. Christ is still the head of the corner. See that? But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. There is nothing anyone can do to change that. But as long as you are unbelieving, Christ and his word will always stumble and offend you. He say, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and even to them which stumbled at the word, being disobedient. And why? Why is that? offense and stumbling because of disobedience. And take note, this is also God's will that you will be offended and stumbled. Why? He said that, where unto also they were appointed. So Christians, the reaction from unbelievers or unbelieving Christians, professing ones, maybe frustration, but this is to be expected because God appointed the unbelieving to be frustrated. Why? We can look at Naaman again. This is the final point, the humbling of the lost, the humility of the lost. In 2 Kings verse 5, uh, ch chapter 5 verse 11, uh, verse 12 to 13, say, he said, Are not Abana rivers of Damascus better than the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away in rage. Naaman was about to walk away from full healing and towards certain death by leprosy. In many ways, someone who turned away from the gospel is turning away from salvation and certain death. 
in the lake of fire. And verse 13 said, And his servants came, and near, came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had said, Bid thee to do some great things, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather than when he said to thee, Wash and be clean? This is where I will plead the laws to listen. Naaman's sermon came to speak to him. Now, in, in essence, this is this. If the prophet asks you to climb Mount Everest, and killed a fiery dragon at the top to be healed, you would have done that because it's a grandiose work. Now, I stop short here because it is important to wake up from the idea that you can do things and even great deeds to be right with God or to have a better afterlife, so to speak. It won't happen and you will wake up in hell. Man, in his pride, thinks that he will be all right with whatever with whoever he will face after death because he thinks that he has not killed somebody or he always gives money to the poor, etc. But when you face God who demand nothing less than 100%, then you know you cannot achieve, but it's too late. Or are you willing to bet that there is no such God but others God that is more willing to accept your idea of righteousness? The servant was essentially saying this, it does not matter what task you were asked to do, it only matters what the prophet had said, which is from God. Yet many will have issue with this. They say they will follow God's word until it contradicts their conventional wisdom until it exposes their disobedience before God. Naaman, however, chose to humble himself. In verse 14, he said, Then went he down and dip himself seven times in Jordan. Listen to this. According to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Something happened in his heart. He made the choice. He chose to fear God. Psalm 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who seek wisdom of this world, fear the Lord first. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments, His praise endureth forever. <coughs> the will of God does not make sense to the lost until the lost humble themselves before God. The saved will always agree that the more they obey the will of God, the more God gives them understanding. That is why people can say they love the will of God because it is a treasure, can never be dark, finished. The outcome of Naaman's choice, that is to humble himself, to trust in the word of Elisha, the man of God, was healing instantly. Then his flesh, uh, the next verse, uh, verse 15, his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was cleaned. Was Naaman washing himself, dipping himself seven times in the Jordan River a work salvation? Well, he literally go down. Oh, yeah, yeah, see, I did. I follow what God tell me. No, it is not a work salvation. He trusted in the will of God from a prophet, and led, that led to his action in washing himself according to the word of the prophet. This is a picture of repentance and faith. Laman looked humble in search of God's healing, but he was not really humble in his heart. He did not fear God. He only feared that he might die. His pride of unbelief was later on exposed by the words of the prophet, essentially, as directed by God, he sent his servant, therefore his pride was hurt. He was offended because the will of God did not make sense to him, but he thanked God, but we thank God that, no, he was also able to humble himself. These are rare, rare instances. This is when Naaman repented of his pride and chose to trust in the will of God. 
Then he was miraculously healed. The loss can be saved when he or she repents of his or her pride and trusts in the will of God with simple faith like Naaman at this point. Now look at the hearts of the saved men in verse 15. And he returned to the man of God and all his and he and all his company and came and stood before him and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now therefore, I pray, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Naaman was a general who accompanied his king to worship a false god back in his home. And everybody knew that. But he was now not afraid to acknowledge that there is only one God. That could get him into a lot of trouble if his boss or anyone hears it and tell his boss. The trust in God takes away fear. The one who experienced genuine salvation also knows what it is to be humbled from the inside. He called himself the servant now before Elisha. Now we also hear this verse, the next one. When we hear this verse, often, and often used in the congregation of Christians. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 to 11. <coughs> and if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Often, this is also repeated after somebody said the prayer. For with the heart of man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confesseth is made unto salvation. But the for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. What is there to be applauded when you say Jesus is your Lord among a closed room of Christians? Bear in mind, when Paul wrote this, he was persecuted by the religious Jews because he said they are not saved. They were not saved. And they have a zeal of God which was not according to knowledge. Under such background, it would take extreme courage to confess Christ as Lord because there will be consequences, sometimes deadly ones. It is not said, in, however, this is not said in the absence of fear. In rather, coming from a heart that one cannot deny Christ because of what he has done in you. Do you know Jesus also told the unbelieving Jews about Naaman together with another woman called Sarata? In Luke chapter 4, verse 24 to 28, he said, And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted unto his own country, now, this is the first preaching that he had in Nazareth. Basically, the people do not accept him, do not want him to be there. Because, he said, is this not the carpenter's son? But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Saratha, the city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. A widow in who is not even a Jew was saved, as in saved from dying at the time, because I, I'll tell you the story in a while. And then in verse 27, it says, And many lepers were in Israel at the time of Elias, referring to Elisha, and the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. None of the Jews was, were, were cleansed, but only one guy called Naaman. And all there in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. Why? Because they were saying, they were saying what he was saying that you guys do not believe. Therefore, you did not receive the blessing. Now, the Jews thought that they were, he was Mary, Jesus was Mary Carpenter's son. And he were, they were offended by the word of God. Now, the, source, the story of Sarapta was this. Now, when God sent Elijah to this woman, because at the time there were already three years and a, three and a half years of famine 
everybody is dying, no food. But then he came to this woman, um, and verse 11 says, 1 Kings chapter 17 says, and as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. Now, let's hear what she said. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a kick, but a handful of meal in the barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks and I may go in and dress it for me and my son. She has a son. And we may eat it and die. This is their last meal. And he did, not, he did not even believe in the God of Israel. He said, the Lord thy God. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. But make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and thy son. Basically, telling a mother who has a hungry, uh, probably dying son, don't worry, just make a cake for me first. Then do something for your own and your children. Many would be, would be enraged. But for thus saith the Lord God, verse 14, of Israel. Now he's declared what God said. The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. What he says is that, you know, it's not, gonna, it's not happening yet, but he says, don't worry, you just do what I tell you to do because God said so that the flour will not be empty. The oil will not be empty. The barrel will not be empty until the day God will send rain upon the earth again and see what this woman do. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah and she, he and her house did it many days. Wow, people thought, oh, yeah, it's, it's a miracle. It is a, uh, some say, oh, it's just a story, yeah? fiction story. No. The story of, uh, we see that what she only do was, despite of her condition, he only trusted one thing, what the Lord God said, which she did not believe in at the time. The story of Naaman, we already know. Now, Basically, what Jesus was telling the Israelites, the entire Israel who claimed to worship God, none of them was saved except for Sarata and Naaman. Naaman, who was, both of them were Gentiles. Why were they saved? Now, I'm not, I do not know for sure that they were saved as in spiritually, but it is a type of salvation. Now, because they humbled themselves before the word of God and chose, chose to believe even above their own lives and their own pride. To the lost person who is listening right now, you know God existed even without listening to a single sermon, right? In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that you and I are without excuse. This message, this message is not preached to tell you that you are unrighteous and godly before God. I'm sorry, I read it wrongly. This message is indeed to tell you that you are unrighteous and ungodly before God. And you will face his wrath at the end of your life. But this God is compassionate, merciful, and He say He is love. Loving you even at this stage when you would think that He is not existing, He sent His Son to redeem you from your sin. That you can be reconciled with this God at this point of time you do not believe in. And not to face His wrath that is to come. But you have to realize this. God has come as, as Christ and done his part. That is to save you. The remaining is for all that are lost to be humble, to repent from the trust in yourself and put your faith in the will of God, which tells you Christ died for you. Such a simple statement offended many millions of unbelievers and even lost professing Christians. 
But I pray that you may choose humility and trust in His Word. Um, let us get to the final thoughts. I didn't write here, but I will read from here. Now, God is the origin of humility. And Lucifer is the exact opposite, right? He fell because of his pride. The father of the laws is Lucifer. It's not easy for me to say this, but it is a fact. It's a scriptural fact. The laws finds excuses to do away with God. These excuses, they have their, they have their own decided path already, but they, are, they can use all sorts of literature out there for excuses to prove their point. But they cannot do away with God because they innately knew there is a God. The laws must first humble themselves before God, understand that understanding of salvation will follow. I pray those who have not known God yet will choose this path of understanding. Let's pray. Any Father, Lord, we give thanks to you. We are thankful for the time that you've given.